story time about people getting electric shocks from online modules for home automation control. So I got a message from a chap called Michael. Let me just read this message to you. Uh, I got this curtain controller, tested my bench, just live in neutral new earth, all worked, added to my home automation system, tested the functions and checked there was 240 volts on the various switched live points. So far, so good. Wired it onto the curtain motor and turned it on. He was holding the earth metal housing of the curtain controller and he brushed against the antenna and got a significant electric shock off it. So he was wondering, is this normal? Because it is CE marked. That's that. The CE mark means nothing in this stuff. Caveat emptor is the best thing you could describe it as. So let's explore it and take a look inside. But I have already checked and true to what was said, if I get the meter in here, set to continuity. And this is where, you know, I could strip the end of this wire. It'd be a lot easier. Let's just dab between live... Uh, there's a diode straight off. There's a diode between live and uh, the antenna. Right, that's enough. That's going to give you a good wallop. So normally with modules like these, they are, because they've got exposed terminals here, you can't just have them mounted to the wall. You have to put, mount them in enclosure. So normally the antenna would be an enclosure, but normally you'd have a bit of heat shrink sleeving over the end of this quite often with the wire just folded double at the end and then the heat shrink over it just to make sure it doesn't pop off and um, that's kind of important because i'm guessing that michael was uh, in the controller like this pressing the little programming button which is needed to actually program the various modes turns this out this is quite a competent little module it's got loads of inputs right tell you what i shall pop it open so it's got this clip let's zoom down this so you can actually see what is happening so it comes to this little clip here that you can either screw directly onto the back of a, well, screw to the back to the wall, I think a lot of people will do, but into an enclosure or it's got this uh, denial mounting facility, which is quite useful. And then this clips into it. The unit itself, I'm, I'm looking for my spudger here. I'm not seeing my spudger. There's my spudger. It was hiding in plain view. If we pop it open, If we try to pop it open, it reveals the circuit board. I'm going to have to undo that now. It just pokes through a hole in the case. It reveals the circuit board with the two relays. And a little stack. It's got a little uh, riser board with two modules on it. It's got the inductor for, I'm guessing, the power supply. Right, tell you what, I shall take some pictures of this and then we'll explore it. One moment, please. And resume. So here's the top of the circuit board you've seen already. It's got two 5-volt coil relays. The incoming supply has a smoothing capacitor. It's got an inductor and then another capacitor. That's uh, just sort of filtering before the switch mode buck regulator. And it's got a fusible resistor. Uh, this capacitor here is for the 5 volt supply. Uh, other things that are visible, just a little peeper. Uh, that's about it. This little stack of circuit boards. It turns out that this is a 433 megahertz receiver and underneath it is the Wi-Fi receiver. Quite interesting. Also interesting, and I'll show you uh, in a moment uh, the circuitry associated with that. The switch inputs, it's got the facility that you can control it via a clicky remote control. Or you can control it via your home automation system or phone via Wi-Fi. Or you can connect a switch which goes between live, switch one, switch two. And then you can just push the buttons for open curtains, close curtains or open blinds, close blinds. To give you an idea of how this controls the motors, there are two relays that switch live to live one and live two. And you wire your motor between neutral and the two outputs. If I bring in a doodle of the motor... There's the open and close inputs. And if you energize open via this limit switch, it powers this winding of a, what I'm guessing is a synchronous motor to neutral. But it also powers the other winding via a capacitor. That causes a phase shift, which causes specific rotation. So open might turn the motor and say that direction until it finally hits that switch when it will stop. If you then power close, it will... Uh, power this winding directly, 
and that winding via the capacitor and it'll wind in the opposite direction until it hits this limit switch. That's what that aspect of it is. Very simple and straightforward. It's used for things like raising and lowering screens. It's a common set of our circuit arrangement. Let's take a look at the back of this circuit board and see what is on it. This is where it gets more interesting. The image is flipped simply so it tallied up with the other image. So everything's reversed here. That's fine. It just means that, say for instance, this capacitor is here and this inductor is here. It just means it's much easier to trace. For a start, they've started by skimping out on the power supply and they've got a single diode that's not a full bridge rectifier. They've got a single diode uh, charging this capacitor up with the live coming via that fusible resistor. Uh, so this capacitor here charges to peak mains voltage. There's an inductor for filtering and then another capacitor which uh, basically charges peak mains voltage. And then there's a little switch mode chip which uh, pulses this inductor. It's a buck regulator. So it's not isolated from the mains. This is where the electric shock came from. So when this uh, powers up this inductor, uh, initially the inductor as the magnetic field builds up, it creates a bit of resistance to current flow, and that is used effectively to charge the capacitor on the low voltage side to 5 volts. When this turns off, the magnetic field collapses, it goes through this free wheel diode, and it still pumps the capacitor up, so it's just efficiently using the build up and collapse the magnetic field to charge that capacitor. And this thing will have a built in voltage reference of 5 volt, it will be a dedicated 5 volt chip. Uh, things associated with this a diode and capacitor, probably for its own power supply. Um, and a sent resistor R300.3 ohms. Uh, and that is it. So here's the 5 volt supply with a little decoupling capacitor for noise reasons. And then that goes over to this, which is a 3.3 volt regulator with another decoupling capacitor for that. And uh, that generates the 3.3 volts for the circuitry. The 5 volts is used for the two relays, which are under here. These pins here are the coils for those relays. The stack... Uh, the top circuit board here is a 433 megahertz receiver. I can tell that because it's using a generic chip. When I searched for it, it said equivalent to blah, 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 which means it's a clone. Uh, and it's got a crystal of 13.52127 megahertz. And that uh, equates to a 433 megahertz receiver. And it has a small chip here which is probably just decoding that information and storing code, I'm guessing, because this can uh, be programmed for, you press the button in various combinations of pulses or hold it for a long press and stuff like that to enter various modes. One is to program the open uh, switch and one is to program the close switch. Underneath that, with its little uh, screening can, is the Wi-Fi receiver with an antenna on its circuit board. Uh, it, if you wanted, I suppose, if you weren't going to use the 433 megahertz option, you could just chop this off. But I mean, I'd leave it on because, well, there's no point doing that. You're not going to have this outside enclosure anyway. It's going to be enclosed, hopefully. Uh, but that Wi-Fi unit, the only other thing here is this mysterious chip. Um, it's odd because this chip, the only thing it obviously drives is a little buzzer. It's that buzzer. Is it uh, actually... Driving it as a coil or is it an, an active buzzer? I don't know if I'll be able to power it from my meter. Sometimes uh, if it's real low current, it may make it beep. I think that might just be, I don't think that is anything fancy. Not sure. I don't know if that's an active one or not. That certainly didn't prove anything. It could either be a self-contained peeper or this little chip here may actually be mainly just providing a stream of pulses to buzz that. That would be odd. But certainly the transistors that are switching the relays are actually coming from the stack, the riser that goes up to the other uh, units. I'm guessing that a lot of this stuff will be done by the circuit board here, the sort of uh, Wi-Fi circuit board, because it usually contains a decent microcontroller, the ESP type microcontrollers. Very strange. Okay, uh, moving on. Each of the relays, when the circuit decides to turn it on, has a transistor and a back EMF protection diode across the coil. The reason for the back EMF protection diodes and these things is that when you uh, turn a relay coil on uh, and the relay clicks in, uh, when you turn it back off again with the transistor, uh, the coil 
de-energizes and the magnetic field collapses. And because there's no load, it can create a high voltage spike. So they put a diode across it for that reason. So the transistor switches it. It's got the uh, diode for the back EMF spike. It's got a resistor here to limit the current to the base because it's an NPN transistor and also a pull down resistor to the negative rail just to actually keep it turned off. And that is repeated over here for the other relay. Uh, the other two bits of circuitry here that are notable are the switch inputs, and they're interesting. I have doodled the schematic out for you, because they're interesting, slightly over the top. It's kind of like maybe a wee bit overcomplicated, but here is the switch input. Keep in mind this is going directly to live. So the switch inputs for open and close, if you've connected external switches, noting they are at full means voltage, it goes from live via this diode, via this current limiting resistor, very high value, uh, 422k and then there's a little bit of a uh, circuitry here before it hits the base of a transistor the circuitry is a 4.7 volt zener kind of not needed because ultimately the transistor is going to clamp that down to about 0.6 volts because when you drive the base of a transistor it acts it looks to all intents and purposes like a diode so they could just have had this capacitor here and they could have used this resistor up there but they've used it as a kind of divider it's all a bit strange. Maybe that's just to discharge that capacitor for uh, to provide a decisive switching on the input, which could have been filled in the microcontroller, but they didn't. But that, this is what they have. Uh, but that provides effectively a DC current into the base of the transistor that turns it on. The transistor has a resistor here that is tied up to 3.3 volts so that when the transistor turns on, when you push that external button, it pulls this input to the microcontroller low and that uh, is what uh, signals it and tells you that you've pushed a button. Is there anything else worthy of note on this? There is not really anything worthy of note. Um, crude rectification, power supply, 5 volt. Uh, section, 3.3 volt section, riser to the microcontrollers, this bizarre little chip that must have broken an accountant's heart because it just doesn't seem to be terribly functional. Um, and then the uh, drive for the coils and the button inputs. That's it, just basically pairs of identical circuitry. Uh, so the answer here is, when you're dealing with stuff like this, treat Everything is it, effectively it means voltage. It should be an enclosure, preferably a enclosure made of fire resistant plastic, just because, well, you know, it's just generic. It's the internet of fire. Yes, that's what it is. So much electronic stuff. And uh, just regard these little wires that are dangling out. If they've not got a bit of sleeve in the end, at the very least, put a bit of sticky tape over the end. It's not going to affect its ability to receive signals, but it will affect your ability to avoid getting a shock off the end of the wire. So that is it. It's a fairly typical little unit, Mo's Go Wi-Fi curtain module. It probably works fine. Accepts input from your standard, I'd guess, 433 megahertz remote, your Wi-Fi and button inputs. Quite an interesting little device.